be before I present uh, Nakamura, please, uh, I let, uh, you know that uh, after his talk, there will be one minute uh, uh, talk for the pre poster presentation by by S. Warea Chakali, so don't, don't leave the, the room, please. So now the, the, the next talk is by Nakamura. He's going to talk about the discovery of a mag magnetically, magnetic, magnetically subcritical pre-stellar core. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I'm Fumitaka Nakamura from National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. Today, uh, I'll talk about uh, our recent results of CCS Zeeman measurement using the uh, Nobeyama 45 meter telescope. Uh, listed here uh, are my collaborators of this project. Okay, this is the outline of my talk. So first, I'll tell you a bit about the uh, importance of magnetic field in the process of star formation. And then I'll show you uh, some details of our uh, receiver system for the uh, Zeeman observations. And then uh, I'll uh, tell you uh, our latest results of the uh, uh, CCS Zeeman uh, measurement. And then uh, uh, finally, I'll summarize my talk. Okay, uh, magnetic field uh, play an important role in the process of gravitational contraction of dense cores to form stars. And there is an important parameter uh, which determines the uh, uh, evolution of magnetic clouds, which is this number, magnetic critical mass. And if the cloud mass is uh, larger than this uh, critical mass, the magnetic field alone cannot support the cloud against the uh, gravitational contraction. And such a cloud is called magnetically supercritical. And supercritical cloud uh, contract dynamically to form stars. And the contraction proceeds uh, within a uh, uh, free fall time, so a relatively rapid uh, evolution. On the other hand, if the cloud mass is smaller than the critical mass, the magnetic field can support the cloud against the uh, contraction. Such a cloud is called magnetically subcritical. And the subcritical cloud uh, can contract uh, by losing the uh, magnetic flux from the central region due to the ambipolar diffusion. But in this case, the uh, time scale of the contraction is uh, much slower than the, uh, uh, that of uh, supercritical case, maybe by a factor of 10. So in other words, the uh, evolution of the magnetic clouds is largely determined by the uh, initial field of strength. So in, in that sense, it's very important to measure the uh, uh, strength of magnetic field associated with the uh, dense cores uh, before the uh, star formation uh, uh, happened, which is uh, uh, we call uh, pre stellar cores. However, the uh, current observation, uh, I mean Zeeman observation, are uh, very limited in the density range. So what do you see is the, uh, some summary of the uh, current uh, Zeeman measurement. And uh, as you see, the uh, previous observations are uh, mainly done with the uh, H1 and OH, but they trace only uh, low density regions. But the uh, typical density of crystal cores is around the uh, 10 to 4 per cubic centimeter, uh, yeah, this uh, density range. And recently, uh, also uh, C and Zeeman measurement are uh, done um, with the uh, uh, 30 meter telescope, but they are uh, trace uh, much uh, denser regions, and also they tend to be strong, uh, mainly at regions where star formation already happened. So uh, in this project, we want to measure the uh, field strength in, in this density range uh, using the uh, uh, Zeeman observations. And uh, to do this uh, project, so we chose this line, CCS, uh, at 45 gigahertz. And the CCS has a critical density of around the uh, 10 to 4 per cubic centimeter, and in addition, uh, CCS is known to be very abundant in the uh, uh, very early pre-stellar phase. And uh, at later pre-stellar phase or after star formation, 
uh, its abundance decline very steeply according to some uh, chemical evolution calculation. So in other words, CCS is very good tracer for the uh, pre-stella cores. So in, uh, in this project, yeah, we try to do uh, Zeeman observations uh, with the uh, CCS line at 45 gigahertz using the uh, Nobeyama 45 meter telescope. And first, we developed our system for the uh, Zeeman observation. Uh, what you see here is the uh, uh, overview of our system. So uh, we developed uh, two parts. Uh, one is the uh, front end and back end. And as a front end, we developed a dual linear polarization receiver called Z45, uh, this one. And uh, as a back end, we uh, developed a spectrometer uh, called Polaris, which is software uh, polarimeter having the uh, very fine uh, frequency resolution of uh, 60 hertz. And in this system, the incoming uh, signal uh, go into the uh, receiver system from here, and the uh, signal is separated into two linearly polarized components uh, with the uh, newly uh, developed uh, uh, OMT, also mode transducer, and the uh, two components go into the uh, uh, back end. And uh, here, we take the uh, cross correlation of the uh, two linearly polarized components to derive the uh, Stokes parameters. OK, now uh, uh, let's move on to the uh, uh, actual observations. So first, uh, we chose the, our uh, target core uh, in the uh, torus molecular cloud. So the distance to the uh, torus molecular cloud is uh, uh, 140 parsec. And the, uh, uh, our system has a beam size of uh, about the uh, uh, 38 uh, arc second at uh, 45 gigahertz, which corresponds to the uh, 0.024 parsec. And the typical size of the uh, dense cores or pristar cores uh, is uh, about the uh, 0.1 parsec. So we can resolve the uh, central dense region uh, with this uh, beam size. And our first target is located here. Uh, this is, a, uh, by the way, this is a, 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 a high risk cloud 2 region. And we chose uh, our first target here, which is one, one of the uh, densest cores in Taurus molecular cloud. And this region has a very prominent filamentary shape like this. And uh, our first point is here, the peak of the uh, CCS. And uh, yeah, here, uh, I describe some details of our observation. But uh, because of the limited time, I skip uh, the, uh, the, these things and the, uh, uh, mention about the uh, last two things. So uh, as an ob observation mode, we adopted uh, so-called smooth band pass calibration. So because of this method, SBC method, we could reduce the uh, total observation time by a factor of three. So this is very crucial for our observation because the, uh, our original uh, estimation uh, uh, tell us the, uh, we need, we need uh, more than 100 hour integration uh, for the uh, single pointing. But uh, as I show you later, uh, uh, yeah, I think we could uh, detect Zeeman shift of CCS within the, uh, about 30 hours because of the, uh, uh, this method. So, and, and also uh, to verify the uh, detection of CCS Zeeman splitting, we observed uh, two lines simultaneously, CCS and HC3N. And HC3N is a non-Zeeman uh, molecule. So we, we use uh, this line as the uh, control molecule. OK, now let's move on to the uh, uh, results. So this is the uh, uh, SOX I and SOX B profile of CCS toward TMC1. So uh, and, and, uh, from uh, this uh, SOX B uh, profile, we uh, derived the Zeeman shift of 134 
0.6 hertz. So this corresponds to the uh, 210 microgauss. And we uh, did the same analysis with the uh, HC3N. So the, the SOX B profile of HC3N is here. So uh, uh, from this data, we uh, didn't see any significant uh, Zeeman shift for the uh, HC3N. So uh, we conclude that the, uh, we detected the uh, CCS Zeeman splitting towards TMC1. And uh, uh, to obtain this uh, result, we had to uh, apply the uh, beam spin correction. And uh, as we already uh, heard about it, the uh, beam skin correction is very crucial for the uh, Zeeman observation. So uh, I'll tell you some details of uh, how we uh, applied the uh, Zeeman uh, uh, beam skin correction to obtain this uh, result. So our bottom line is the, uh, our system has a, a beam skin of about the uh, two arc second, mainly along the uh, azimuth direction. So we obtained this uh, value by observing the uh, uh, methanol measure of OMC2. And uh, we also obtained the uh, velocity gradient of TMC1 uh, uh, from the uh, OTF data of CCS and HC3N and applied the uh, uh, beam skin correction. And uh, Next, uh, I'll show you how beam skin correction uh, affects our result. So uh, first, we, uh, I uh, uh, divide our data into three different uh, parallelic angles. Yeah, uh, the value uh, uh, shown here. And uh, uh, before the uh, uh, beam skin correction, uh, OK, uh, this is the uh, uh, Stokes V profile of HC3N. So uh, before the uh, beam skin correction, we see uh, uh, very significant fake Stokes B profile, yeah, like this. And after, but after uh, beam skin correction, so uh, those uh, profiles are disappeared like this. And this is the uh, CCS case. And uh, uh, for the CCS case, uh, even after uh, beam skin correction, we see significant uh, Zeeman shift uh, of the order of uh, 100 hertz. And the uh, dependence of the uh, uh, parallelic angles are not so strong. So we conclude, uh, we detected the uh, Zeeman splitting toward TMC1. And uh, lastly, so uh, I estimated uh, several pr uh, physical parameters of TMC1 using the uh, value we obtained from the uh, Zeeman observation, which is uh, 210 microgauss. And I have time? No? <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll mention only one thing, uh, which is the uh, mass fluctuation ratio of uh, this object. So uh, uh, estimating the uh, column density from uh, AV map and C18 of data, so uh, uh, we obtained the uh, critical magnetic field strength of order of uh, 100 uh, microgauss. So that indicates the uh, uh, normalized uh, mass flux ratio of TMC1 is about at 0.5 for the uh, line of sight uh, uh, component. So uh, uh, we conclude that the uh, TMC1 is uh, magnetically subcritical, and if we uh, plot our observation point in the uh, Kratcha diagram here. So our point is here. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, congratulations on your work to add another molecule to our limited repertoire of Zeeman molecules that we can use. Um, we also uh, looked at TMC1 and OH at Arecibo, and a uh, comparison of the two results is kind of interesting. Uh, we got a 
magnetic field strength of only 11 microgauss, um, and mm -hmm. uh, column densities and volume densities about an order of magnitude smaller than what you're sampling. Mm -hmm. um, but we got a, uh, the mass to flux ratio being super critical by a factor of seven. So it, it taking this at face value, it means that the uh, mass to flux ratio goes from super critical in the lower density envelope to subcritical in the core. Um, mm -hmm. And you can also compute the uh, exponent in the B proportional to density to, to a power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, if you do that, and again, taking all this at face value, you get an exponent of 1.7. Uh, mm -hmm. So both of those results are uh, interesting to compare with uh, theoretical uh, predictions and models. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you had done that or if you had any comment on what I just said. Thank you for your suggestion. Yeah, I, I, I'll compare with the uh, OH uh, Zeeman effect, uh, Zeeman uh, results. So, but uh, maybe the, uh, your point, uh, which is your point, MC1, in this, this diagram, <laughs> around here? Uh, yeah, uh, following up on, on Dick's comment, uh, that's, if that's what you see, that's exactly what you would expect when, when you're assembling a core from a larger object that is already magnetically supercritical. Imagine that you're just taking the core and somehow you're clipping it to just the highest density parts. So the magnetic flux doesn't change much, but you're reducing the mass. So you naturally see less mass and therefore you get a, a larger, uh, a lower mass to flux ratio. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what we were pointing out in, in a paper in two, 2005. So in that case, if I'm cor correctly uh, interpreting Dick's comment, that would mm -hmm. be more or less in line with your results of what's happening between the, cent the central parts of the core and the envelopes that, that you get a, a higher criticality uh, towards the envelope and lower at the center. Is, is, it, is that yeah. my yeah. interpretation? Mm -hmm. Take just yes. one last question. Uh, Hi. Um, sorry. Uh, did I miss something there? Normally, we fit the Stokes V mm -hmm. to a, not only to the derivative, but also to uh, the i scaled by a certain factor. But your equation seemed to indicate that you had fitted it to a constant factor there? I, is that A0 supposed to have i in it? Uh, uh, to derive the, uh, uh, this value, we first fit the uh, uh, Stokes i to calculate d i d nu. And then we fit uh, Stokes v with uh, this function. I see. And, and we get the, uh, this value, and uh, also standard deviation of, of the uh, uh, least, least square fit of this uh, function. So you, so you is subtract? It normal, is it, is it, is it a standard procedure to obtain the uh, Zeeman shift? I mean, I uh, we have uh, not so much uh, experiences for the Zeeman sure. observation. Sure, maybe we should discuss this. More yes, just yes, discuss that uh, during lunch. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just the last question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have a question as well. Uh, judging from what I saw there in your slides, the Zeeman uh, signal is fairly small compared to the uh, unbeamed squint corrected signal. That is to say, you have the, before making the beam squint correction, uh, mm -hmm. there is a fairly significant signal in the Stokes V profile, and then after the after the uh, beam squint correction, that sort of goes away, leaving something left for the Zeeman effect. But I wonder, uh, beam squint is only one type of instrumental polarization. What matters in the end is whatever differences may exist between the right and left circular polarization response of the telescope. And beam squint is just one. Um, there's something else uh, Carl Hylas has looked into a lot in Nation earlier called beam squash. Uh, I wonder if it's possible that that uh, you're not actually making the full instrumental correction when you uh, uh, derive
survive the Zeman effect if perhaps uh, what is attributed as attributed by you to the Zeman effect could not be the result of some other somewhat higher order uh, uh -huh. difference in Tom, the let's case. let's wait for this interesting technical uh, uh, discussion okay. for for lines between the, uh, the expertise and, and Zeman yeah. yeah thanks okay yeah. thank you very much, very much. Yeah. So, let's move uh, now to the uh, one minute slide uh, of, uh, yeah. uh yeah, let me talk from now. So, <laughs> so myself, Vishraya Chakli, actually, uh, my talk was, uh, although my talk was there two, two days before, uh, it's very, very nice and very excited to present my poster among various uh, magnetic field presentations. So I literally magnetized with very less turbulent. So, uh, so my poster actually presents uh, uh, many results on optical and uh, near infrared polarimetric observations towards star forming regions. And, uh, uh, yeah, in uh, towards uh, uh, CPS OB3 cloud, cloud complex, you can see a coherent magnetic fields from uh, a PC, uh, PC parsec scale to few tens of parsec scale. But if you see the magnetic field orientation within the larger scale in the galactic plane, except this small cloud, the magnetic field orientation is different from the uh, largest uh, largest scale in the galactic plane from the the CPS OB3 cloud complex. And then towards some of the uh, like uh, very distant uh, star forming regions, we didn't see obvious change uh, in the magnetic field orientation. Uh, Rather, we see a, a, a clear galactic field component. So this, even though we don't ch see the change, it may give some important imp implications on uh, uh, dominant component of foreground dust. And in order to have possible, you know, uh, feature observations in the submillimeter uh, and uh, uh, I mean uh, submillimeter polarimetry and CO data, I would like to have, uh, uh, I mean, further collaborations. So please visit my poster. Thank you very much. <laughs>